Hello and welcome to episode three of Ships, Sea and the Stars from Royal Museums Greenwich. We are bringing you this every week with incredible stories of sea, the space, history and creativity with Royal Museums Greenwich curators and with external experts. If there's a question that relates to our topic that you'd like answered or a subject you'd like to, us to address in the future, do please get in touch. You can go to Facebook or Instagram or Twitter and search for Royal Museums Greenwich and you will find us there. So please get in touch. We'd love to hear from you. So today's topic is staying healthy at sea, art craft in art and craft in isolation. And it's long been said um, that the devil finds work for idle hands. And it's certainly true that at sea, sailors have occasionally during long periods at sea had lots of idle time. And what do they get up to? What happens? What happens to your mind at sea? What can you do to help? What coping strategies have people found throughout history to find their way through this? And what do modern seafarers do to deal with isolation at sea? And um, we are going to delve into the many things that both the museum's collections have that speak to this and also a look at the modern day. And to help us with all of this, we have two of the museum's curators and an external expert. So let me introduce you to Sue Pritchard, who is Senior Curator of Art at Royal Museums Greenwich. Maya Wassell-Smith, a doctoral researcher at the National Maritime Museum, and Captain Graham Westgarth, who is the CEO of V Group, and that is a shipping management company. So each of you, what's your connection to this topic? When we think about um, health at sea and, and health, staying health in, healthy in isolation, what, what are your different takes on it? Maybe let's start with Sue. Um, I'm particularly interested in the way in which um, art can be used as a tool, not only in terms of being able to relieve anxiety and stress and recovery, um, but also to give us something um, to focus on in times of crisis or in times of um, intense anxiety. Um, and some of my research is based around the idea of that, um, particular artists and their relationship with the sea. Um, and I think at this particular time, when we're in lockdown and we're being actively told to stay away from the coast, we're an island nation, we're never more than 70 miles from the sea. Art is a way in which we can connect with our, our kind of coastal heritage and use, I think, um, art as a way in which we can re-engage with the natural world. Brilliant. And Maya? Um, so I'm doing my PhD at the Maritime Museum using their collections of sailor art. Um, I'm interested in the how, the why and the for whom a sailor is making. So how, where are they getting their materials from, what are they making, um, why, you know, what social and emotional function does making provide, which is, you know, particularly pertinent for today's discussion, and for whom are they making? So how are they building kind of social connections through through craft? Brilliant. And Graham? Well, I've been in this industry now for 49 years. I joined my first ship in 1971 and uh, spent 18 years at sea. So even though I've since then spent the last 30 years in various management uh, roles in shipping, I still consider myself to be a harder seafarer. And uh, as I said to my wife uh, the other day, then you know, actually this lockdown isn't that much different from being on a ship. You know, so it's, uh, uh, but so my interest is in really you know supporting seafarers wherever I can. And it has been very striking. I think everyone I know, because I go to sea as well. Everyone I know who has spent a lot of time at sea has gone, oh, recognise this. <laughs> this feels very yeah. familiar except the floor doesn't move. So to get, us, to get us started, or if it does, you've got other problems. Um, to get us started, we're going to hear a clip from a master mariner who was called Henry Ralph Harvey. Uh, and he was working on merchants and passenger ships uh, that went between London, Asia and Americas in the mid 19th century. He kept a diary. That diary is in the Caird Library at the at Royal Museums Greenwich. And here is a clip. I sailed again on the 26th of November, 1872, and having no passengers and being very ill, I should have had a very dull time had I not, thank God, discovered a latent talent for carpentering. I am sure I had often prayed for a hobby and was most thankful to find one. I wanted a square box for my sextant, and I thought I would try and make it, and succeeded so well that I made another, and then a work box and then more workboxes, which I inlaid with ebony, and then at St Helena I bought some French polish and polished the things up, and they looked so well that I kept on working and found my health daily improving. In fact, I may say that I have been quite fully occupied with my tools more or less ever since, and I've had good health with it. 
from which I infer that there is no cure for mental or bodily sickness like hand labor. So I love that clip because this is kind of he's discovering as he goes, he sort of starts off and he goes, oh, I'll make a box. And he's like, oh, quite like this. I'll make another box. And there's a lot of um, creativity to be found with not very much. What, what struck each of you about that passage? Oh, who's going to go first? <laughs> uh, I, I think for me, I think um, what's really pertinent is the way in which the making absorbs him into a world away from focusing on health and worry. He starts off by saying, I feel ill. And then he, in, the crafting then takes over the whole narrative. So he doesn't focus on what's wrong with him, why he's ill. He focuses on that making and the production of something and that absorption into the, the materials of his craft. So you can always forget he's on this ship. Um, Graham, how about you? What struck you about that? Yeah, I think it was the kind of self-recognition that, you know, that he needed something else to occupy his mind. Otherwise, you know, and it had to be something that, if you like, produced something. So, so it was material. Uh, otherwise, you know, and, and I think we see it sometimes today, if, if you don't have another interest, another distraction, that then the mind can potentially go to places that you, you don't really want it to go to. And it's interesting, isn't it? Because it has to be a physical object. There's something different. I mean, we live in a world, a digital world now where there's screens everywhere, where there's infinite numbers of stuff you can do sort of through a screen, but it's not the same as holding a physical object. How about you, um, Naya? What, what, what struck you in that passage? Um, I mean, I think the extract is a wonderfully lucid account of um, the positive effect that craft can have on, on mental health and well-being. Um, I'm interested that his journey into carpentry begins with utility essentially he needs a new box for his navigational equipment um, but in the process of making this first box he discovers that not just that he's quite good at carpentry which might be quite satisfying um, but that this process of working makes him feel better so he then enters into this kind of crafting fervor where he's making different types of boxes and uh, trying out different techniques in inlay or or in uh, or in polishing um, and so as he's kind of going through this journey he's developing a, a strategy essentially for improving his own well-being um, and I think that's that's not just important for the position that he's in then but that he's that he's developed this strategy for the future that he's empowering himself to feel better. It does make it sound as though the ship is going to be very full of boxes. You do wonder whether there's a bit of OCD creeping in there. Don't yeah. you? <laughs> more boxes. Yeah. Um, well, we're going to start with uh, a, an object that Maya selected from the museum collection, and it's two beautiful miniature baskets that are made from peach stones. Maya, tell us about these. So uh, these miniature baskets, as you say, are made from peach stones. They're absolutely tiny. They're about um, two centimetres across. Um, they were made by an unknown sailor, sadly. Uh, in the world of sailor craft, we often don't know who the maker is. Um, they were made on a passage in, in 1872 from Melbourne to England. They were given by the crew member who made them to the children of a family of passengers. Uh, I, I imagine to be used as playthings who'd been carried along by doll and bear, by dolls and bears. They're yeah, very much doll sized. Um, and I think that these show us two really interesting aspects about craft and creativity kind of in isolation and in the ship at sea. Um, and I, I think the first one is about how um, the ship at sea, like a house under lockdown, is, is very much limited in terms of the craft materials that you have access to. Um, and unless sailors had taken things to sea with them, they needed to kind of improvise, reuse the things that they had to hand. Um, and, you know, this led them to use a, a very wide variety of things. So food waste, as in as in this example, but we also see them using kind of scraps of canvas or rope, money, coinage, shells, metals such as pewter um, and parts of animals like albatrosses and sharks and whales that they catch. Um, I'm interested by how intricate some of these objects are. I mean, these are these are just sort of hollowed out peach stones, but they 
it must have taken a sharp knife and you're on a boat which is rocking around and it it's, it's quite I mean they're very delicately made and yet you're in an environment where you know if you were going to pick a place to <laughs> do delicate craft work you wouldn't really pick somewhere where um, everything was moving quite so much and yet they're so intricate anyway was it was it hard did they all just cut their fingers the whole time yeah. I mean I think working on a ship and working with rope you probably had pretty sturdy fingers anyway <laughs> you know hundreds of calluses and things um, but I think they were also quite used to intricate work so things like uh, knotting rope and um, sewing required these kind of skills and, and, and adapting your skills to, to taking into account that kind of movement. And how much time did sailors during that period have? I mean, there's this, there's kind of two pictures of sea, aren't there? There's the one where the captain is shouting at everyone to do things and you have to pull in sails and do stuff and, everyone, you know, it's all hands on deck, quite literally. And then there's this these long periods where you're just sort of going somewhere. Did they have much... Was leisure time a concept or was this kind of sneaked into five-minute periods between other activities? Um, I think it probably varied drastically between different trades. So you know, things like whaling, the, 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 the narrative that we have is that you could be waiting a really long time between kind of seeing uh, a whale spout on the horizon and heading towards it so that you'd have lots of time to do things like this. Um, but if we're thinking about a warship with, you know, hundreds and hundreds of people, your time was very strictly regulated. Um, you had the watch system and then you might have a couple of hours less of time built into that. But whether you kind of prioritise sleeping or making, I think it would be quite different. <laughs> And were these always individual projects? Are there any is there any examples in history of people working together on a project or is this private time? This is the only time you get to do your own thing. Um, again, I think it's a real mix. So we certainly see sailors who are involved in um as you say, like solipsistic making, making just by themselves as a way of kind of uh, improving their own well-being um, as a private act but we certainly also see creative projects amongst sailors and I think one of the really exciting and interesting things in terms of thinking about mental health is how skills were traded so sailors were showing each other how to do things how to make things um, but also making things for each other like the sailor here who's giving um, a crafted gift to the passengers there are also sailors who make presents for one another it's, well, that's nice, isn't it? It's nice that there's still community in there. And was there, were they, I mean, I guess the concept of mental health, as we would call it in the modern Western world, is quite new. But was there a sense that this, was there, was there a, con, what did that concept exist at all, even if it had a different name, that this was something you did to stay sane almost? Yeah, I think very much so. I mean, as we saw in the Henry Harvey quote at the top, he is, you know, very, very explicit in saying that this hand labour, as he calls it, is what is improving his his mental health. And um, I think potentially it's uh, expressed in different ways, though, as, as, as you say, there's much more discussion about kind of keeping idle hands busy um, that is essentially kind of expressing the same expressing the same idea that if we're making if we're doing then we start to feel better that we don't have time to kind of ruminate on the things that are making us anxious it's, it's interesting because i you know as i reflect back on my career then there's no doubt i sailed with people who definitely had mental health issues but actually there wasn't nobody ever talked about mental health at all you know they were, they were just strange or you know or there was some other uh, label attached to them but there's no doubt that it, it, it's, a, it's always existed it's just now I think there's just more understanding and focus on it. I've always thought so my time at sea I've definitely I've thought that actually ships can be interestingly forgiving places because if somebody has a particular what the outside world might call a quirk you know something in the way they behave is different or something in the way you know the way they deal with the world is different everybody else gets used to it and they don't have to explain it anymore and and there is this really interesting thing where I've definitely I've seen people at sea who are disfigured in a way that if they were on land, you know, I, I can imagine it might they might be pointed at quite a lot or, you know, people would notice what well, on the ship. Everyone 
they you know they they've got they've got over it in a way they're used to it it's it stopped being an issue as it shouldn't be but it it does offer an interesting environment all right let's move on just on the topic then of of um inside people's heads sue let's look at your net your object your first which one which is this picture the boat builder's yard so can you describe the picture a little bit tell us what this is all about Yes, so um, I chose this because um, it's actually one of my favourite um, paintings that is currently hanging in the Queen's House um, in Greenwich. Um, and it's an old painting by Henry Herbert uh, Lafon, um, and it dates from 1881. And as I say, I'm particularly interested in the way in which um, artists have a relationship um, with the text site. And um, Lafon is one of several English artists who followed the French realists in painting along the Brittany Coast in the 1880s. And here he's chosen to depict um, a boat building yard in Concal in the northwest coast of France. And of course, Brittany had many uh, beach boat yards of the kind portrayed in the port in this picture. But what interests me is the female figure. And she's in the foreground and to the right. She's in profile, but she's gazing to the left and she's gazing into the middle distance. She was actually in the act of actually um, knitting, but she's placed the knitting aside and she's taken a moment to reflect. She's wearing traditional local dress, a blue serge skirt and a grey and white striped chemise and a white headdress. And she's wearing traditional sabots or wooden clogs on her feet. So she is, she is somebody who has um, who is working. She's a working girl. Um, but she's taken this moment to, to just place her knitting aside and just to take a, uh, what we would now call um, a moment of mindfulness. And what's so wonderful about this painting is the light. You can feel the brilliance of this sunshine and her head is slightly tilted to, to really capture that sense of warmth on her face. Um, and I say, for me, it's one of my favorite paintings. And it really reflects this idea that I think at the moment in lockdown, we're all constantly online, um, constantly being bombarded with um, training courses and how to do. And um, I was in a frazzled cafe online with um, Ruby Wax, and she was saying how she was feeling particularly anxious because she was moving from one online training course to make a cake to another to how to play the, the piano and constantly filling your day with things to do. And I think this painting is an opportunity for us to realise that actually, Sometimes we need to step back and reflect and just do nothing and just be in that moment of, of that particular moment in time. And it is perhaps an opportunity. I mean, now that, that you know, art and music for many people, they're sort of there, but they're too busy to look at them or to take time. I, one of the things that's very striking to me is that if you go to an art gallery or, you know, when, when we could go to art galleries, when we will be able to again, there's two sorts of people in there. There's the ones who walk through. And they they look at all the things and then they go to the next room. And then mm. there's the people who are just sitting. And I always mm. think it's strange, actually, that art galleries don't have more seats. They don't have. I mean, I can see they don't want people to sort of perhaps crowd in. But but it's interesting. There's two ways of relating to art. And, and perhaps all of this is teaching us to, to value the, the sitting a little bit more. I think so. And um, certainly, I mean, as I say, I was um, quite interested in doing a little bit of research on um, art in hospitals. And of course, um, art in hospitals goes back right back to the medieval um, period um, where art was being used in a very religious um, context. But um, in 1859, um, Florence Nightingale, in her notes on nursing, actually makes the point that art is very beneficial for recovery. And she says the variety of form and brilliancy of colour that the objects presented to patients are actual means of recovery. And I think it is those people who are sitting and actually engaging with a, a work of art on a very emotional one-to-one -one basis that maybe find they're finding something within that painting, whether it's the narrative or the colour or simply the materials, the, the oil on canvas, the brush strokes, it gives them a sense of removing from whatever anxiety or worry there is in the world. And um, it's interesting that art then has two, there's two functions here. There's creating it is a comfort. And then it may be that looking at it is, or knowing it's there is a comfort. And they, that, that, that might be for different people, but it sort of, it keeps giving in that way. Um, is, are, there, are there examples of people in history 
you know, not just big works of art that many people find wonderful, but are there examples of people just finding little things that they've made, you know, sort of local craft and art, finding that comforting? Are, are there any examples you know of where some, there's, you know, periods where people had something in their house, perhaps a, not quite a relic, but, you know, a precious thing and just having it there helps them along? Um, I think, well, certainly with um, Maya um, and our conversations, we talk a lot about that idea of um, the sort of benefits of sewing. Um, and I think particularly for women and indeed for men, and you find this in the 19th century in um, India, where you have officers um, and they're using embroidery and they're making their, their housewives or their needle um, holders. Uh, these tiny little things that give you an opportunity that you can, and I was really interested in, in Maya when she was talking about her boxes. It's like there's the process of making the box, but then what do you put in the box? You know, that idea of you are making, but to what end? And I think for me, it's the preciousness of the objects which are being made to contain something that is equally precious. Yes. Yeah. It, you win both ways around. Um, <laughs> We're going to move on now to a modern example, because obviously isolation by itself can be bad enough. Uh, and then there's lots of things, you know, on, you can have a good ship or a bad ship and, and that can all cause its own frictions. But sometimes things go really, really wrong. And then you have to deal with the aftermath of things having happened. And, and Graham, we're going to listen to a clip here. Um, do you want to introduce it just a little bit? Tell us who Naresh Dekonda is and and explain why this clip exists. Yeah, I think uh, Naresh was a net well is it was an engineering officer within V Group, and uh, he was on a ship that was unfortunately hijacked in uh, off the West African coast, and then subsequently the crew were kidnapped and held in the jungle uh, and, and subject to fairly extreme conditions for a number of months until we arranged their release. Uh, so subsequently, uh, they were released. They were returned to, to their homes. Uh, Naresh is from India. And uh, he was, we obviously provided whatever support was required, but he was diagnosed with uh, post-traumatic stress disorder and uh, obviously under, underwent treatment for that. Uh, but the outcome of was it, in, he, after some time, he said, how, how can I actually help people uh, understand what I've learned that may help them in, terms, in, in times of adversity? So we have a training company which we use to develop a, basically a video, uh, which then became a training part of our training portfolio that goes out, uh, that our seafarers undergo. So it, it's a remarkable uh, young man, a remarkably courageous person. And uh, you know, the, the reason in some ways it existed is because he, we re re recently recognized him uh, in the company. He won something called our CEO uh, Values Champion for uh, 2019. Well, let's listen to the clip. Um, and, uh, and this is him talking about his recovery. Myself, as well as the other crew members on board ship was mentally and physically exhausted and we were completely aware that we will not be able to recover soon from this ordeal that we had went through. The owners as well as the managers of the vessel that is V group has arranged for a medical team together with a counselling team to come on board MT Barrett and take a stock of the health of the crew members on board after this ordeal. The crew members including myself were supplied with the necessity necessary communication equipments as in this case it was a mobile phones, a couple of mobile phones being brought on board in order for us to speak to our family members and let them know that, that we are safe. So we've got um, a, 
you know, he's talking about how to recover. And the thing that I, the place I wanted to start, Graham, is this idea of the um, the captain of the ship or, or, you know, the owners of the ship bearing some responsibility for the mental health of people on board. As, as modern ship owners, how much is that a part of your, you know, operational outlook? It's it, it, it's very significant and it's grown in significance uh, over the last few years and, and you know, in terms of awareness and understanding. Uh, you know, so the, first of all, there's awareness, then there's the understanding, and then there's actually what what can you then do about it? Uh, so I, I think we now uh, in the phase of uh, awareness, and we understand more, of course, I don't think we'll ever understand everything, but now it's actually what, what we can do. So we, we in V Group, we have something called the V Care program. Other companies have other initiatives they have, which I think it, it looks at it in through two lenses in, in, a, in a way. So one is what we call the mental health uh, support, whereas where we provide uh, the ability for uh, seafarers who may be undergoing mental health issues to actually to uh, to access counselling or, or online support from from experts in this field, and then we have something called our physical well-being and, and uh, social engagement, which which is basically uh, an, an app that, that can be online or offline. And how that works is uh, on a weekly basis that the, the ship will have access to a number of activities that are a number of recommended activities. And they range from you know maybe goals around running on a treadmill to actually uh, playing a chess match or you know watching a video together. So we're trying to get people to interact socially and, and, and also look at their well-being. And then we also what, have what, a, what sort of thing can people do on a modern ship? You know, we were talking uh, earlier about you know with Mayor about ships where it's definitely it's a wooden ship. It's very there's confined quarters. You've not got much to start with. But today on a modern ship, there's internet, like we heard from the rest, you know, there's, there's mobile phones. What for a modern seafarer, how what do they have that sailors in the past didn't have that help with all of this? I, I think, uh, well, first of all, <clears throat> and I'll come back to the internet access because that's a double edged sword in a way. Uh, but I think the you know, every ship now has a gym. You know, a, a lot of ships have swimming pools, albeit small. And uh, you have a great story about uh, a master I was talking to, and he was telling me he did these Ultraman triathlons. Triath uh, and I said, well, how do you do your swimming training? And he said, well, I just try tie elastic bands to my legs, and then I swim against the elastic bands. You know, so there's necessity <laughs> being the mother of invention, I guess. <laughs> and, uh, and and so the the, the there are lots more physical facilities, and of course, you know, most you know most ships have uh, video rooms or social uh, environments that the where people can interact in, and and of course we do have internet access. But I, I think the internet access is it's interesting, and, and this is I have nothing to really support this. It's just my view is, on the one hand, it allows them to keep in touch with the families and friends, but on the other hand, I think it can create isolation because they're not. They can't physically involve themselves with some of the activities that they're that they're close. Those who are close to them uh, are involved in, and I think that's a, I think that's a real issue, actually. Well, at so, the moment, uh, they can join in just as much as everybody else, can't they? Yeah, <laughs> I mean, I, I, yeah. That, well, I that's think, true. That's true. But you I know, I mean, although they, you know, I think they have more problems with video calling than we might have even here. Go on, see. <laughs> But I, I think this is a real, this is a really interesting point as a museum cu curator who's particularly interested in in sailors' craft, is that you know there's a lack of of kind of um, of we're not faced with the ability to be able to collect anything um, from the 20th and uh, century and, and contemporary um, uh, sailors' craft because they're not, as I understand it, they're just not doing it because it's the technology. Which is it? Which has kind of taken the place of the crafting. Yes. But it's an interesting thing now. I notice as we're all in isolation that the things that have sold out online have been baking supplies, craft supplies, DIY supplies. You know, it it feel and in a way I found that reassuring because it means people haven't forgotten. <laughs> you know, the online world may still be there, but 
if push comes to shove, they could people do know they can entertain themselves with relatively limited you know craft craft is still there as an idea and i i found it that is valuable. it is but i think what's really interesting is that it's not being passed down um it's not embodied knowledge that's being passed down it's there's still you're still using youtube um and online courses to show you how to do something so whereas within the 19th century and, and mayor's research we've got that sense of sailors passing on skills and teaching other sailors how to actually make or, or create. Now we can order the, the, the kit and then we're straight on YouTube to show how to do it. So culture is passed down differently. Graham, are you aware of sailors make, modern seafarers making things on ships or is it all more passive sort of activities? I think, you know, it's, it's in, I hadn't thought too much about it before this discussion actually, but it, it's interesting that uh, I'm not aware, and I was trying, reflecting thinking do I know of anyone who and I've met the other, per, other, other person who likes photography who likes painting uh, not too much beyond that and but the, the, you wonder whether whether we kind of there's an opportunity there to to provide introduction to that that mm. type of approach you know and uh, and I literally hadn't given it probably because I'm not that way inclined myself but you know although I do like art I must admit but it, it, it's it really, it, it, I think it's an interesting opportunity because well, there must Sue, be. Sue is super keen that you're. Is, your I, am, I am super keen. <laughs> uh, well, I think it's, I mean, in some ways, if you look at um, other um, lockdown uh, spaces like prisons um, yeah. and you get, um, you know, charities such as Fine Cell Work teaching um, sewing skills to prisoners, to inmates, um, and you get, you know, Prisoners will say quite openly that when we're locked down for the entire weekend with perhaps just an hour for exercise, it's the, it's the sewing, it's my patchwork, which keeps me sane and keeps me off the medication. Yeah. So there might be something there. And I would be really thrilled if we suddenly had an influx of um, 20, 21st century sailors craft coming into the museum. <laughs> I do. I was taught when I put the first ship I ever went on, uh, I, first research ship. I was sat down by the chief scientist because he'd given me a to, to, a rope to splice, and I'd said I don't know how to do that. And he's like, "Well, you sit in that corner and you do it till you've learned." <laughs> was, uh, he taught me a bit, and then he sort of left me to it and with some instructions. But but there was even ten years ago, there was something about you are learning a physical craft, and I I do have research colleagues who sketch at sea and do art a little bit but they kind of they're quite shy about it I think there's more of them than we might might suspect okay well we've given Graham a task then to to provide <laughs> the bearers with ways to uh, start making things so that the museum has things to put in its collection <laughs> uh, I was just I was just thinking earlier I have a shortage of shortage of tasks at the moment so that's a good I have to add another one to the list <laughs> Okay, if you're if you're just joining us, you've joined us halfway through. This is Ship Sea and the Stars, the weekly online broadcast from Royal Museums Greenwich. This week we're talking about staying healthy at sea with curators Sue Pritchard and Maya Bustle Smith and maritime expert Graham Westgarth. We're going to move on now to a clip from Moby Dick. It is an extract, um, and obviously Moby Dick was written on based on the years that Herman Melville spent on whaling vessels in the 1840s. And here is, um, here is that clip. Throughout the Pacific, and also in Nantucket and New Bedford and Sag Harbour, you'll come across lively sketches of whales and whaling scenes graven by the fishermen themselves on sperm whale teeth, or ladies' busks wrought out of the right whale bone and other like scrimshander articles, as the whalemen call the numerous little ingenious contrivances they elaborately carve out of the rough material in their hours of ocean leisure. Some of them have little boxes of dentistical-looking implements, specially intended for the scrimshandering business. But in general, they toil with their jackknives alone, and with that almost omnipotent tool of the sailor, they will turn you out anything you please in the way of a mariner's fancy. So I like that because it's it, there's a lot of flexibility there. That they're not the idea that they're not just um, you know that if you want something they will make it, which is also a necessary thing. It it sort of does both jobs. It's craft, but also it, it's physically useful. And um, now, Mayor, you your next object is an example of this. You've got a woolwork picture. Um, tell us what a woolwork picture is first of all, and then tell us a little bit about this one. 
Yeah, so wool work pictures are uh, embroideries made by sailors, um, or particularly associated with sailors. Uh, they come into, you start to see them um, from about the 1850s, although um, we don't know at the moment too much about, about the reasons for, for this like boom in, in their production. Um, and they are produced all the way up to kind of post First World War. So they're a really long running, they're a mainstay of the sailors um, craft as a genre. Um, the one we have here is made by Charles Whedon. Um, he was a sailor who served in both the Merchant and Royal Navies. We don't know much about his career in the Merchant Service, but um, he spends about 10 years in the Royal Navy after signing up in 1859, um, spends time on various ships and then leaves in about 1869, first working in a dockyard and then getting married and seemingly ending his association with the Navy. We're not sure at what stage in his career he made this wool work picture. So whether it was whilst he was still at sea or whether it was um, after he'd retired. Um, but we do know that he was a prolific maker of wool work pictures. So um, in the museum's collections, we have four Charles Whedon wool works. There's even one hanging in the Queen's house. Um, and there are several others in private collections. So I think it's safe to assume that he uh, enjoyed making them um, and that he found the process of making them enjoyable and and potentially for the conversation today um, he you know he found it he found it positive for his for his mental well-being so um, why wool why why is that did that was that a thing people did on land or is that something that was particularly suited to to craft at sea yeah, there was um, very much a trend in the first half of the 19th century for Berlin woolwork pictures, um, mainly made by women rather than men. Um, and this came about because of uh, technological changes in dyeing in, in Germany. Um, they became very good at producing very bright colours uh, in, in dyeing wool so that there was this massive explosion of embroidery by which people were, were creating these fantastic pictures. So yeah, the, the sailors seem to have adopted them. Uh, my research at the moment is trying to find out how, why that happened, why sailors suddenly started doing that. Were there charitable organisations putting together packs of Berlin wool to send to sailors so that they could so that they could kind of keep themselves busy, staying off the booze potentially? Um, or were were people selling them in ports? You know, why are they doing this? And um, I think it's also quite a, so their, their construction is generally scrap wood, um, mitered and made into a frame with the, with canvas, potentially not sail canvas, but one of the other duck canvases that they would have had on board, nailed around the frame to create this kind of taut ground. Um, and then the, the picture drawn usually with cinder and then, and then embroidered. Um, I think one of the really interesting things about this object in particular is that the stitching is so fantastically dense. I don't know whether that will come across on your computer screens, but every inch of the image is packed with these um, long and short stitches. And so I think, you know, that, that potentially tells us something about this process of stitching that, that Sue alluded to earlier as a, as a restful, a therapeutic activity, you know, it's a repetitive movement and as you're doing it you, you develop this kind of comforting, potentially slightly hypnotic rhythm. Um, so yeah, I, th I think it's a, an, an exciting object in terms of those. those it sounds like you had to take quite a lot of stuff with you. This isn't stuff that, this isn't an, an object that was made from bits of thing you found around the ship. This is you know it, it took you had to take needles you had to take wool maybe you found the canvas on ship but there's quite a lot of preparation here was that common for for craft on board ship or, or is it you know how much did people plan for it um, I think certainly people planned. They probably would have had na uh, needles at least um, by themselves because they needed to fit, met, repair their own clothing, make their own clothing. Um, they probably would have had some embroidery thread so that they could mark their clothing with their initials. So they're already doing bits and pieces about this. Um, creating the frame, I think, potentially could have been done um, just by kind of... Uh, uh, make, sidling up to the carpenter and asking for a few scrap pieces that you could make into a frame and as I say the ground that they're using for the embroidery is probably um, 
if not sailcloth, then then another another scrap uh, canvas that would have been on board. But as you say, the variety of colours in these things, they do seem like things that um, were planned for, and whether that was sailors doing it themselves, picking things up in port as they went, or whether it was um, organisations creating bundles and sending them out, I'm yet to, I'm yet to find out. And do these change much over time? So in my head, and you know, I don't know the history of this very well, when I think about sailor craft, some quite a lot of it looks quite similar to me. There's carving things, there's sewing things, um, and there's probably some other, you know, there's some quite basic categories. Do fashions come and go? Perhaps Sue um, knows something about this. Do, do fashions come and go in the types of crafts that are used? Or is it just that carving and sewing is what you can do so everyone for centuries did carving and sewing I think it is um, as I say it is about that idea of embodied knowledge it's the skills that you're learning that are not just being used for craft they have a very practical application so as, as Maya said you know you're, you will have a, um, a, a needle because you are sewing your sails you're sewing your uniforms you're, you're mending your slots so I think it's um, something that's born out of a um, a practical need um, on board ship, but then it develops into something that's perhaps uh, more decorative. Um, and I think, um, again, that idea of perhaps gifting, so you're making something to gift to somebody at home, a loved one at home, um, which is why I think the idea of stitching something and sewing something to then give to a, a wife, a mother, a sweetheart, is it has an emotional connection because it's very it is about that idea of something that's very um tangible um that is 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 very precious within the context of home it's a domestic craft the gift giving things away is interesting isn't it because it's a, it is a connection to that person um but also it means that they don't pile up. I often, I mean, I just from my personal experience years ago, I lived in Rhode Island uh, in America, which is a great place, but in the winter, it's very, very quiet. So I, I knitted. It's the only time in my life when I have knitted for any length of time. And and I knitted things to give away. And honestly, partly it was, it was because Christmas was coming up and that's something I could do. But it was also that there's a limit to the amount of knitted things I needed. <laughs> and part of it was that you feel there's a kind of, it's, I was do, in, in a way I'm, I I wanted to do something for somebody else, but I couldn't do the things that they wanted. So I was going to make a hat cause, for them because it made me feel better. You know, there's this sort of I wanted to give things away, but really, if I was really strict about it, I was probably doing it for myself. But the feeling of being able to give it away was really important. And let's move on, Sue, to your next object, which is uh, another painting, and this is catching a mermaid. Tell us about this painting. Um. So this, um, again, it's a uh, uh, late 19th century um, oil and canvas. Um, it's a work by the artist James um, Clark Hook, who was born in London, but actually it was a visit to Clavelli in Devon, which really prompted him to adopt coastal scenes as his main uh, motif. Um, and he was particularly interested in showing both the hardship and indeed the rewards of life at sea. Um, it's a, a painting of three children. Um, they're in the act of actually recovering what is in fact a, a ship's figurehead. Um, but obviously their excitement and um, their, their kind of uh, childhood discovery is the fact that they're actually finding an actual mermaid. And you can see in the painting that they're complete with, they've got the boat hook, they've got the rope, um, the young girl is holding back the younger boy so that he doesn't kind of put himself in danger whilst the older child is trying to recover and haul this mermaid um, from the sea. And I love the fact that um, there is this sense of both innocence, childhood innocence and discovery um, whilst they're on, on the beach, whilst they're on the coach, but it's against this background of a really quite turbulent um, sea. And you can feel that kind of sense, that juxtaposition of both um, something that is quite a, an innocent childhood pastime, but against the dangers of what it must be like to live by the sea. It's interesting what it says about the universality of discovery, isn't it? Because we think of discovery and adventure and expeditions as being something that you need to be a special person with lots of kit and you need to be on an expedition to discover the thing. And actually, this reminds everyone that that's part of the fun of being a child, right? Is that you can go and 
discover things and it's a great excitement to find a thing on a um, beach that a sailor might look at and go oh that's just an old you know old piece of wood but it's so exciting yeah, and it, it really shows that discovery is relative you don't have you know y- you find your own discovery and it's all exciting absolutely and I think you know I chose this particular, this particular painting because you know we are in spring we're we're at um, the point where normally we've got three bank holidays and what you would normally do is you would go to the coast and you would spend your time on the beach. Um, and I think for children, there is that kind of idea of, you know, you are finding the pebbles and you are in the rock pools and you're picking up shells. Um, and so for me, I really wanted to present this painting as um, a kind of symbol of hope, actually. So we know that this will pass at some point and hopefully we will have the summer holidays um, and children will be able to re- just rediscover um, those, those simple pleasures of just being at the beach and being able to, to really rummage around in rock pools and experience that sense of not only the crashing waves and the sound of the waves, but also the smell of the sea. And I think that idea of, you know, the, both the boys are barefoot and they're on the rocks and you can almost feel, it's quite tangible, that idea of the wet, slippery, slimy seaweed between their toes. So I think it is an op- it's an opportunity, I say, to perhaps practice a little bit of mindfulness and think about how it would feel to be those children on the beach. And that is something we can all do. You know, as a, as a scientist, I see the world around me as being full of toys. You know, there's all these little discoveries that you can make either in art or in science, you know, that they are there. It's just that we ignore them in normal life. And, and perhaps the, all of this is making us focus on the joy of those little small things. And we did have one question from Twitter about figureheads. Uh, so we'll deal with that now since we've got a figurehead in your picture. It's from Duncan Breeley. And the question is, why is it that the ornate figureheads of ships disappeared with the passing of sail? Um, um, well, you really do need my, um, I'm going to do a shameless plug here for my figureheads book <laughs> you, really, you, well really, done. <laughs> you really do need to speak to my um, colleague my co-author Jeremy Michael who um, knows much more about ship technology but basically the technology changes so is it that you don't a, a figureheads wooden is it is it to do with the, not having wooden ships anymore or is it because you don't have is it because there's a you don't need a bowsprit and a sailing uh, exactly exactly yes so it's, it's, when, it's when you move sorry no, I'm just going to say, I mean, the ships nowadays, you know, the, the, the product of, you know, the, the ability of computers to streamline uh, the, the, the profile in a way that it makes them super efficient, you know, so if, and uh, so anything that encumbers that is, is surplus to requirements, really. So it's, <laughs> That's they, such a functional engineer's view. <laughs> <laughs> All your beautiful figureheads are surplus to requirements. <laughs> you know, I, I was involved in a project some years ago, and we did, looking for a, a to optimise a hull, and we did 40,000 computations uh, you know, on a computer in a matter of, in a, in a very short period of time. And... Uh, you know, you know, I reflected back to when I was uh, at one point working in a shipyard in the northeast, uh, and uh, you went into the drawing office there, and and there were, you had the lines drawings, and you know, dozens of people working on specific lines on a ship, uh, you know, and you know, and you couldn't do more than a dozen computations, and you couldn't. Do, and now it is in a matter of hours or days, you can do forty thousand. And so none of just, them include a mermaid. And none of them include a mermaid. <laughs> so, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm sorry to say. It did. So Actually, Duncan, the, Duncan, the answer. You were, were talking about that. It reminded me some years ago. I uh, I, I was involved in a salvage operation, and uh, they, unfortunately, the ship sunk in the end. And uh, and it was a roll-on, roll-off ship. And uh, as the trailers, you know, as they got buoyancy, then they snapped all the chains, and then they broke open. And then on the beach, the beach the next morning was full of TVs and uh, washing machines. And uh, so somewhat different to uh, to bow spritz, if you like. Yeah. Well, I'm sure there's still there was still some adventure for some children. Uh, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Washing machines on the shore. Uh, so, Duncan, the answer to your question is that when ships had a sail, they needed a, basically a long pole sticking out the front of the ship to maximise the leverage on the sail. And once you take that 
that take away the need for that, you've got nowhere to put your figurehead. So now we know. And um, let's just finish off then with Graham a little bit more about modern seafarers. And I was wondering about expectations of isolation, because obviously one thing that people feel at the moment is that they didn't get a choice about whether they were isolated or not. But going to sea, um, you know, I knew when I first went to sea that isolation was part of the deal. And yet I see PhD students now struggling a lot more with it, you know, because they're used to having more technology. So I was wondering whether you see changes in expectations about what life at sea is going to be like. Yeah, I, I think it's... It... I think the other thing that's, and it's all part of the same thing, is there's more and more top technology coming to play. And so there's more and more uh, discussion now uh, around autonomous or ships. And I think that's still some way off because of the reliability of equipment. But what I think we, we, we will we'll definitely move towards that, which means actually you'll probably need fewer people on board, and there are not too many now, but actually they may have different skill sets than we've seen previously. So I, I think it's a, the next decade or, or the next two decades, we'll see some significant changes, I think, in you know, what people do and how they do it. And you know, they will become more and more connected. And, and that will bring its, its own challenges. And, and, uh, and I think one of the, you, know, you may find that we simply can't keep people on, on ships as long as we have historically. So, so, so it may be that seafarers, on the in the merchant navy then are coming you know that there may not be much there's no new scrimshaw coming along the line because there won't be people with time to yeah. do it yeah so I, I think that's you know it's it's the functionality of what they do today and we went when we talked about splicing you know I, I think if you ask somebody to splice today then it will look at you somewhat strangely uh, so on a research ship they can all still do it on a crew yeah. we need the research ships are interesting actually because you have you still need that flexibility you still need to do things that you're you know you can't do with robots and you can't do uh, with yeah. big autonomous systems and maybe the research ships will turn out to be the last bastion of um, <laughs> all the seafaring crafts and um, we have run out of time so we're going to have to finish there uh, which is a shame because there's clearly loads more to discuss as we are all in isolation but we've all got some new craft ideas uh, and Graham's going to go and get some craft on board some of his ships yeah, that's course, it yeah. um, so we'll be back every week with more museum objects all the expertise of our curators loads of things in the collection that we'd love to share with you and share their stories and share their relevance to modern life. If there's a question that you would like to be answered or if you a topic that you'd like us to cover, please find us on social media, on Facebook, Instagram or Twitter. Look for Royal Museums Greenwich. Um, next week, we will be considering communication at a distance, keeping in touch while in isolation. How have people done that in the past and how are people doing it now? So last of all, I'd like to thank our three fabulous contributors, Sue Pritchard, Mayo Wassell Smith, and David Westgar uh, Graham Westgarth. Uh, thank you to Simon Kane for the readings. James Gill was the producer. I'm Helen Chersky. See you next week. <laughs>